tonight's concept, which is an absolutely uh, uh, wonderful way to begin to think about some of these issues. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, lots to think about there. And then we're going to go into something now completely different. Specific, <laughs> applied, I think. So, uh, as my co chair, I'm going yes. to leave you to introduce yourself. Yes, I think. yes, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So good morning, thank you very much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Paul Riley and I am a research fellow in this department. This is Stefan Gans, who is from the University of Northampton and I'm a practicing field archaeologist and this gentleman is a practicing fine artist. And our presentation is about the things we've learned by refracting our different practices through each other in the context of field work. And the field work, which we'll tell you about shortly, um, and particular are ways of using making marks through drawing, from using hand tools, through different types of uh, finding out about surfaces and solids, have started to drive insights into our, both our understandings of how we make meaning from the world, how we explore the world. In the context of this, So most of the conversation has taken place in the shared, uh, in the shared space of joint attention uh, provided by a, a Iron Age fort um, in an area of outstanding natural beauty known as uh, Mola Gaia, uh, which is based in North Wales. So we're just, just towards the kind of front area here uh, where, we've, we've, where we've come together. Um, and most of the insights discussed here refer to Trench 3X uh, a 25 metre uh, long by 5 metre wide trench cutting through the middle rampart uh, and outer rock cut ditch. Uh, and we gratefully acknowledge uh, Professor Gary Locke uh, and John Powensett, who are the project directors uh, based at the excavation site. And on a personal note, uh, I'd also like to thank Simon Callery, the artist, uh, for the invitation, inviting me to come up and, uh, and meet Paul uh, and the rest of the archaeology and archaeologists uh, at the site. So we've actually been having this conversation for four years and the shorter answer is we found a way through the archaeology, we've now started finding coherent rampart interfaces, ditches and all the things that people would recognise after we've excavated and that in due course will produce a uh, type of plan and uh, materials that will be published. Now what we want to do is actually go back and talk about how we got to this position to make sense of that rubble madness that you can see in front of you. Uh, on the way we'll be talking about how things have come together, the people, the archaeology and the tools we're using, the interaction between those. So if I can just We want to begin by drawing your attention to the Germanic verb dragen, which is the root of the word to drag and to draw, two gestures which throw the hands out and pull it back to you, to the centre of your body. And the various tools we use to explore spaces. So we would like to shift the attention away, the di our different ways of knowing and wayfaring, not the dominant discourse you'll see about archaeology in the reports or what you'll see about drawing theory in the, in the university drawing schools. So these features we've showed before are not found, they are interactively produced as archaeologists work their way into, through and out of each new context involving processes, and this is crucial, of improvisation. Every time we have to adapt to the reality in front of us and negotiate, blending the, a negotiation blending the excavator, the context, and the tools. We argue that through these interactions, the tools, deposits, and diggers mutually constitute paradata. Paradata being data about the process of how you obtain the data that you're reporting on. So, for instance, the striations on the edge of the trowel, the memory muscles in your arms, this auto archived data appearing on the instruments and yourself as we proceed forward. So we're not going to resort to the language of surveillance and control. We're talking about auto-generated paradata. So on site, we also use 
what Jeremy referred to as cognitive artifacts. So these are pre-canned processes of recording data where the data is interpolated or expanded or re re represented using algorithms, many of which become quite opaque to most of the people. So we've got uh, GPS, we've got ground penetration radar, we have magnetometer, and we, so we, we generate these drawings using machines. We also use conventional report slow archaeology, and we draw to scale, 1 to 10, 1 to 20 sections and drawings. We spend a great deal of time in front of the trenches, intimately probing into the space and producing these stereotypical um, forms of mapping. These drawings that get, end up published are actually being drawn several times before <coughs> for on practice. So when I'm there and I've got a 45 metre trench, 3 metres deep, and I've got 75 sheets of permatrace at 1 to 10 flapping in the wind, it's not really useful when I'm trying to explain what's happening. So I sketch it down under a sheet of A4. I also move away from the representations into the abstraction. We're working on the Harris matrices there. And particularly when people arrive, you know, we're using other ways of pointing, drawing on the space, scoring the sections on the material itself, on the archaeology, to show what we think is the change, the variation, the things which appear to be meaningful to us. These are all starting to use these, these motions, which we can say are different forms, extended forms of drawing. And based on the artist, this is a little homage to Richard Serra, who used verbs, these are certain types of drawing that we use in our daily activities. Now, our, our conversation explore some of these things in, in more detail and how our instrumentation and the conversations make us more aware or less aware that we're doing these things. So Stefan came to our field work some years ago, four years ago, and the first thing he noticed was not getting his eye in to see what was happening in the stratigraphy. He heard us before he got there and he was already aware of this orchestration which he remarked at the time, it sounded like a drawing room, a life drawing room. So the trench became a life drawing trench. So life, room and trench merged. Molagai was no longer a hill, but was transformed into a surface or support for drawing. A surface to receive marks and delineation as an extension of paper, interrogating drawing directly through the land itself. It became a place to learn something new about drawing beyond normative conventional processes and activate new approaches for describing a place, site and space extending beyond the visual image. Pencil was exchanged for a trowel, the hands of the archaeologist and their practices appropriated by the artist. I think it's important to note at this point as well that my practice resides within the realm of contemporary drawing. So, in other words, the pluralism is a, is a key, um, uh, key part of this process and, and, and as a multi-practice has been engaged with drawing. <coughs> okay. So, through listening and hearing all of these sounds of the archaeologists over time, what I ended up doing was recording from the very top layer to two and a half thousand years Iron Age at different stages during the excavation process and then began to become really excited with piecing these together. And through this process, I started to engage and listen to certain tombras, land tombras, which were being realized through the making contact with the trout. But also the rhythms were, were, were highly evident through this process. I'll just shut up for a minute, you can listen. So as the slide presents, there are roughly around about 8, 000, over 8,000 troweling marks, if you like, recorded and then uh, composed together. Okay, that's fine. So, here we go. Sonic stratigraphy was born through this process and through a dialogue uh, with, with Paul in Trench 3X. The artwork Sonic Stratigraphy is recently de is derived through the audio visualization software 
of, uh, of, son of a sonograph and explores acoustic signatures within the ground realised and activated through contact with a trowel stroke and an archaeological defined surface. The interfaces between layers are recognised by changes in the tone and or frequency. Associated prominent frequency ranges are displayed by darker tones <coughs> along the vertical axis emphasising strengths of frequencies. <coughs> These patterns are emphasised in the above image and appear as, repeti as repetitions through mark making or drag representing the excavator's rhythmical encounter with the surface. The graded tonal ranges across the image represent subtle and prominent frequencies, measuring decibel amplitude levels in digital systems in decibels relative to full scale. Rhythmicity and or cadence and gesture are realised through this process and also present the signature of a group of the excavation team or an individual depending on the recording. The drag actions become expressive through tone and vertical delineation. The horizontal axis depicts time. The notion of a, of a land, surface or context timbre is instilled through this process, including a summary of the tactile intimacy of a conversation with the land. Okay, this then moves on to a sonic strategic series, presenting an interrogation of mark making over time through archaeological surfaces from masking and troweling through to natural soils. The image reveals and embodies sonically an existential experience of a specific haptic engagement, something that Rawson refers to as linear phrasing. And again, this engages with um, imaging in a non-Cartesian context. So as you can see through the different layers now being constructed, it's a way of building up a notion of layer and drawing practice. Okay, cool. So um, what we're trying to do to introduce you is the idea that we're building up a taxonomy of gestures, a taxonomy of marks, sonic marks, marks on the ground, marks on the surfaces. And we're starting to move towards what Helen Wickstead has described as the stratigraphy of gestures used in field practice. So here's a short um, exploration of a study of pole excavating. So you, here you can see a series of linear phrases which are taking place. Um, straight lines, arc-like curves, angle curves, exponential curves. These are all linear inflections and they produce basically, there's a purity of thought which is initiated here through that ground surface which is being engaged. Um, and that's when worked in conjunction with uh, video-based imagery too. So, linear phrasing, the piece of linear phrasing here in front of us now. Um, there's an exploration of mapping, as I said, in a non-Cartesian way, building an inquiry into our relationships with surface physically and depicting an approach which expands from 2D linear inquiry into 3D volume, known as plasticity, uh, the inquiry of depth. Each pattern is distinct to the owner and often is attributed to their level of experience and ability to tune into the surface. The gamut examines the set of directions employed within a drawing uh, connecting shared meaning between both artist and archaeologist. The plasticity of the lines recall the erasure of material as they rematerialize uh, the transit of a gesture. Marks embody and externalize our ex existential experience through and onto material. These here are condensed. So what we're looking at here is Gavin has recorded the, the previous one. We lost the time element. Gavin then, <coughs> uh, Stefan, sorry, <laughs> Stefan, is, <laughs> Stefan, I, I challenged him on this. I said, "Where is the time?" And he goes, "Aha!" Uh -huh. So we, having now analysed the direction, the gamut of how things are flowing. He then breaks it apart temporarily. The cameras are frame by frame. He's cut out paper and built this data. Where the, the data where they touch each other is a kind of paradata. So the lines are, in Ingold's terms, moments of decision. But while my hand leaves the ground, this is the transit through the surface, I'm making the decision. So the moments of tension are not in this frame at the moment. So I've reappropriated in this image. Stefan stealing my gestures into his maquette, this three-dimensional drawing. And we have RTI'd one of these representations of my work 
and we've rendered it specularly so it looks like graphite again. But what's really interesting to me is not only the, the chronology and the shape of the gamuts, but we have this extra data. About, we're going back to the volume of the space we just removed. We're not dealing with surfaces as archaeologists, we're dealing with solids. So the ontological twist in here is this engagement between the linear phrasing and the archaeology, and this us playing with the ontology and the aesthetics moving from virtual to real and back to virtual. So, to close. So, in terms of the theoretical underpinning of traditional drawing practice, there's a variety of really, really poignant things that, that Paul and I have, have, have realised through this process. So, in other words, drawing theory, if you like, has come into the foreground um, where we've realised things like signatures and authorship. Um, through and thinking through mark making. So for example, you will have novices who will, uh, or people who haven't excavated before who will come in and work in a certain way as opposed to uh, professionals which have a far more gestural approach and exploration, uh, a, a measure of probity and exploration through their uh, linear inflections. Um, also there's a parity, there seems to be a dialogue of uh, a, a shared vocabulary, if you, feel, if you like, as well, um, between the drawer and the archaeologist. And then finally, from our point of view, from the, the, the archaeological digging fraternity, we're starting to see this idea of the auto-archived material, the instruments and the record becoming advocates of one another, but what actually happened in the journey to get the data. So these marks can now be reconceptualized as both art and paradata and way marks to field archaeology. <coughs> so we are trying to open a space which we're going to describe as embodied analysis of rhythmic phrasing of the dematerialization, which brings the act of archaeology to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you.